Welcome to the Open Data Gov Jam online workshops that we're going to give you to kick off this unique innovation challenge that will continue uh, at an in person event later today, but also beyond um, during NYC Open Data Week, which we're very happy to be part of. And uh, even further, you know, looking ahead to potential collaborations. And uh, so today we're going to be talking about open data governance and setting up experiments with decentralized autonomous organizations, which are powered by blockchain technology. And we're very excited to be part of NYC Open Data Week. Like I said, you know, thanks very much for this opportunity to learn more about NYC Open Data and how we might improve the availability and accessibility of such resources that are you know, super important for the communities around the city. You'll uh, you know, be glad to know we're, we're doing an in-person event as well to gather people here at the Blockchain Center, uh, Upper West Side. And this was made possible by NEAR Foundation and the Governots, um, which we're representing here today. Um, and the online workshops for the next two hours will focus on these two presentations and workshops. Uh, so first we'll have a presentation by the governance, myself and Renzo D'Andrea, and then a presentation by two real world data DAOs focused on decentralized science, um, uh, artificial intelligence, and, and uh, providing a kind of coordination system that enables the monetization of data. And we'll dive into this a uh, particular slide uh, with Renzo, who will be leading the workshop later. And he works with me and the community of governots who are exploring uh, questions about polycentric governance with special interest in DAOs. Thank you, James. Thank you, uh, Zach, for this opportunity. Um, I think we would like first to say thank you very much, everybody, to just join the workshop today. And uh, I think governots are we can say an ensemble of researchers that came together last summer and we had very different uh, approach but all with the same purpose to uh, tackle the governance as a driver for innovation in organization. So from qualitative to quantitative, focusing on education, organizational culture, uh, conflict management, ecosystem, but we had this idea of okay how we can come together and basically create an impact for the community. And we want to deliver actual research activities that could engage and share equally inside for different really entities that don't need to be part of the web free world. So we want to be very inclusive. And therefore, the first thing that we did was actually to raise uh, funds through a Gitcoin grant, I will touch upon later. And the idea was to expand this community uh, over time as it's happening. And um, I think we, we want to set up basically research DAOs. And the idea of a governance is to also to consider everyone, even today, in, you are the governance. So you will be part of this movement. They want to uh, engage in experimental workshop, structured experimental workshop. And the idea is to uh, generate is uh, uh, um, to engage in, in decision making process. So, and this is where I think we can consider the challenge that you will go through today. You will have insight from the exercise as a benchmark, as a, a starting point. And then I think we will guide you through what will come next. But now if we go on the next slide, I think we can consider uh, this idea of DAOs. I think on the right side, you can see this uh, basically this uh, um, flower with uh, different areas. So you want to unpack the concept of DAO. So, um, so as uh, James said, DAO stands for the centralized autonomous organization, but it actually is an online bottom-up community organization without power concentrate in the middle. And you can see how these layers of technology called smart contract basically can program rules that could be executed and they could be basically defining two basic functions in this uh, concept of DAO. So who owns what and how decisions are made. 
So there's a networked organization because in this community you can belong from different network, but you can come together uh, uh, with a purpose. So that's why the first point here and the bullet point is a proposal for collective decision making is facilitated by network incentives. So now we consider basically DAOs as a way that could provide members with a voice through governance. There is no hierarchy and there is a fluid work streams where allocated resources could achieve a core mission. So now let's consider uh, these elements on this image. So onboarding. Onboarding is a very important in community and to understand, okay, what are the skill set, the work streams that could be the building blocks of this community. And this is very crucial uh, to navigate members of the community uh, to understand their needs and how to match their need with existing projects. I think you can contextualize this also in your context of data uh, uh, driven organization. There is also the idea of reputation. So in the DAO, there is no an HR function. So your effort is equal to your will to contribute and make your contributes counts by engaging with others and creating basically proposals. So imagine now the voting and coordination that is connected. So there are voting mechanisms that actually they are based on a continuous signaling of a preference. So um, I would just want to give you this a little input of this area. So we don't need to go into details, but the idea of a token engineering actually sounds complex, but it's actually in the word. So it's just the engineering the token in order to model different attributes of the token. So you can see how, for example, you want to compensate your community and there are actually um, uh, mechanisms called, for example, Coordinate or SourceCred. There are tools that could measure value in the community. And uh, finally, uh, the funds management is about the treasury. So it's a very, it's a very important function in the DAO uh, um, environment where the, the, the treasury spending is to reward core contributors and attract the right set of new contributors. And this is actually important to uh, how to program these treasury fun functions and management without a third party. So you can see here, basically, uh, this is not about a crypto world, but it's about to creating uh, uh, low barriers to engage communities and eventually create accessibility in governance. So this is what actually you would be doing today. And I will just uh, pass back to, uh, to James to uh, basically guide you through the next steps about why and what kind of a tools could help you today. Cool, thanks Renzo. And I think we've made it clear, you know, uh, when we're thinking about blockchain technology and Web3 and uh, its connection to open data, uh, we're, we're not looking at, you know, putting data on chain. Um, it's a different use case, different approach that we're hoping to highlight. Um, and we, we call them DAOs, um, but it's, uh, you know, these beautiful flowers uh, sprouting around the city that we hope to grow. And I'll go through our guiding research and some tools that we're using for today and the open data governance challenge overall. Uh, so our guiding research was by uh, Kelsey Nabin, who is looking at DAOs in various contexts, but has written this great article, um, this piece about DAOs as data trusts. And uh, this really, uh, provides a familiar system, a, a mechanism uh, that works legally in defining your approach to data stewardship. And um, it's a good way to really uh, avoid the complications of trusting the stewards um, with you know, upholding the rules um, because you can actually have programmable rules and, and have a, a way to you know, validate that everything is going according to those rules. Um, so it's kind of like this phrase we use um, in positioning, you know, thinking about code is law and, and what that means. But uh, what she's proposing is definitely more of a automated um, system. And I think that what we're trying to do is highlight all of the, you know, or at least some of the 
legal mechanisms for data stewardship along with data trusts. Um, and then we're going to use the data ecosystem mapping tool based on the methodology from the Open Data Institute uh, in the, the workshop. And then going forward, we're taking inspiration from the GovLab Data Collaboratives Canvas and uh, thinking through how that might be applied in uh, DAOs uh, for planning purposes and actually creating proposals. So first we're gonna dive into a few legal mechanisms for data stewardship. Here is the data trust model. Um, we pulled this from Kelsey's reference in her paper about DAOs as data trusts. Um, there's a piece by the Ada Lovelace Institute uh, focused on uh, these three uh, legal mechanisms. First of all, data trusts, you can see how there are fiduciary duties. That's a crucial detail um, when comparing to the other models, especially, and uh, wanting to kind of, you know, have some edge or like some kind of enforcement um, where, where you can actually rely on this uh, trustee, which is, you know, executing the, the plans or the, the desires, like the stated uh, goals of, of the uh, trusters, you know, the, the people who are, um, you know, involved outside of just the, the trustees, uh, so the stakeholders and participants. Um, this is really good for, for managing the liability aspect, for, you know, making sure that you have uh, someone to, to trust, you know, it's in the name. But we also have um, kind of a more positive frame, I think. Uh, when you're looking at data trust, it's mostly about preventing something bad from happening. Uh, so it's, you know, upholding the rules um, by, by trusting you know, some responsible party uh, to, to manage that risk. And with a data cooperative displayed here, uh, you can see how it's more about when people are collectively pooling resources and you want to be able to coordinate and you know, organize those data resources for companies, researchers, and any, you know, participants in the public or private sector. Uh, so you have all these individual data subjects and they're contributing data. Um, and this would be a little bit different. It's more like your, your neighborhood co-op grocery or uh, a living space uh, that uses a co-op model. Um, there's a shared ownership and uh, responsibility. Um, whereas in the data trust model, you're putting all of that into one particular entity. Um, whether it's a DAO or it's a legal uh, structure that is more familiar to, to the community. Finally, you have corporate and contractual mechanisms. So these are kind of just your run-of-the-mill approaches uh, for you know, data exchanges. And um, you can see there's you know, two data users on either side, and they're, they're kind of going through this independent data steward. Um, and you have providers and and then the users on either side. Um, so this mediator in the middle uh, is, uh, you know, written into a contract, um, a legal contract. And you can imagine how automation or, or these kind of like more accountable um, mechanisms through DAOs might help the independent data stewards with, you know, any kind of uh, monitoring and reporting and uh, th they can also, you know, enforce that compliance um, with the rules that are programmed into the DAO. And, um, you know, that's, this is a good way to just illustrate how, you know, smart contracts are not legal contracts, uh, but they do have certain properties that are, uh, you know, automatically enforceable, and, and that's really useful. So I'll uh, maybe... Pause there. I guess um, we can wait for questions, but if anyone has a, a burning question, feel free to interrupt. Uh, we, can, we can get to any questions. Uh, but now we're kind of moving into another model that isn't from the Ada Lovelace Institute report, um, but actually from a group called the GovLab, um, based here in New York City at NYU. And they offer this data collaboratives canvas. So 
data collaboratives are all about exchanging data. And so it's about creating value together as uh, we think beyond just public private partnerships and more about, you know, the actual work getting done and collaborations happening. So this canvas will be really useful in uh, participating uh, for the open data governance challenge because you can actually fill out this canvas and turn it into a DAO because I think, you know, whether it's a data trust, a data cooperative, or uh, just kind of like a, you know, agent model where you have a smart contract that complements a legal contract or some corporate structure, uh, you, you probably in, have some kind of collaboration involved. Uh, so data collaboratives are just a, a thoughtful way of, um, you know, focusing on the processes and, and building uh, solutions that respond to the, the actual problems. And uh, it's, it's definitely worthwhile to, you know, build on this with more specific legal mechanisms. Um, so the Data Collaboratives Canvas really offers a, a great starting point, um, but then you can talk about how DAOs might um, operationalize this or, or like really bring a structure and, and uh, set processes for the governance of some open data resource. Um, so that leads me to our introduction of the Open Data Governance Challenge, which is kicking off today. And wanted to go through our purpose and objectives. You can see our challenge question, uh, the prompt for anyone who is participating, uh, virtually or in person here later when we do the kickoff event. Um, but we have uh, many projects across you know, civic technology platforms on the Civic Tech Field Guide. And of course, the NYC Open Data Portal has a projects gallery and you know, all kinds of projects and uh, initiatives that are, uh, you know, relying on that open data. And we're asking the, the question, you know, where is that data stored and utilized? Um, you can think about uh, ways to improve open data governance with DAOs. Um, with given the, the knowledge in this you know, exploratory session and the collaborations happening in our governance challenge, we hope to increase understanding of, of how these unique structures can, can help. And uh, I briefly you know, want to touch on the idea of shared ownership and responsible coordination as the high level theme. And uh, DAOs provide a really great opportunity to build meaningful relationships with community groups. Uh, civic engagement is one of the, the main goals and uh, it helps to ensure that we're making an impact with strategic use of open data. Uh, and our mission uh, for this challenge is to increase accessibility of NYC open data by supporting experiments uh, that you'll design uh, as participants. So uh, anyone who's watching or uh, anyone who discovers the Open Data Governance Challenge will have that opportunity to submit a proposal. And uh, these proposals would involve potential coordination mechanisms that improve open data governance with greater accountability. The context here is all about community outreach and civic engagement. You can see how DAOs might help. You've got membership. Uh, you can have a poll that enables members to voice their opinions. Uh, you could have collective actions being proposed. Um, with DAOs, you could uh, propose to interact with any other application that lives on a blockchain um, doing any functions available uh, as a group. So whatever you can do as an individual account, you might do as a DAO. And then there's going to be a reward system in many DAOs, uh, we actually did a three-month research initiative focused on DAO reward systems as uh, the governance community led by Token Engineering Academy. And we can share more about those results. Um, and then, you know, as I kind of alluded to, a lot of it is about experimentation and learning together. So uh, we're just, you know, combining the knowledge from specific uh, use cases and, um, you know, the the experts from NYC Open Data, for example, um, can help us a lot in communicating how DAOs might uh, improve 
uh, the availability and accessibility of data. So our vision here is a world where all people have control of their data, money, and the power of governance. And I believe blockchain technology enables more accessible participation, which is crucial for enabling more accessible uh, open data, um, because we need you know more participation to inform the strategic use, but also the you know collection of of data sets and um, the identification of needs or any problems. Uh, so, really interested in citizen provided open data resources as as a way to you know bring the worlds together of you know civic technology and government and um, beyond. So we, we've noticed, you know, the NYC open data coordinators are responsible for performing public outreach and uh, even doing presentations with the aim of increasing strategic use. So with DAOs, you can actually, uh, you know, achieve this goal in a way that has more impact on the actual governance of, of the open data. So there's a way to legitimize these community outreach and um, civic engagement uh, efforts that are happening across the city. And, you know, just wanted to throw this up here. We're hoping to meet the users of NYC's open data. That's why I'm here. I'm hoping to get a better understanding as a citizen of this great city. You know, I, I want to help increase availability and accessibility of the open data because I feel it's imperative for development and evolution of, of this of this great place to live and and work and uh, grow as people. And so overall, we're, we're trying to facilitate connections and collaborations with open data. And this open data governance challenge is meant to explore ways um, for evolving that coordination. So we're, we're uh, open to ideas, um, excited to learn, and um, we're particularly focused on these two uh, treasure troves of projects, the NYC Open Data Portal, and Civic Tech Field Guide, but if you have other sources of NYC uh, data, um, any any kind of ideas would be considered. Um, so feel free to to bring in stuff we don't know about. Uh, and you know we're thinking about all 59 community districts and, and going forward, what we can do uh, is you know really on the ground um, engaging people to join and participate in DAOs to influence the direction of strategic. Uh, open data resources, and you know we're we're trying to create proposals. So that's the outcome we're looking for, is proposals. So you can uh, join us for the workshop today, and then you can fill out a data collaborative canvas, or you know some other kind of canvas um, for a business or um, anything that might be adapted for DAOs, and then submit a proposal to our our data DAO. Um, which has funds available for prizes and uh, other fun uh, tokens like you know, non-fungible uh, items that represent your participation and success. Um, but yeah, now we're going to talk about the workshop and dive into the Open Data Ecosystem Map tool the uh, Open Data Institute provides. But first, just wanted to throw up this nice diagram found on Google and uh, there's a gray bubble at the top, which provides some context in uh, learning about what is data ecosystem governance anyway. So we're talking about participatory capacity, continuity, communication, incentives, user selection, and collaboration. And you know this uh, would represent a more traditional uh, frame to consider when we're mapping the NYC open data ecosystem. So just think about, you know, demand and supply and the intermediaries, infrastructure, um, and it's just a useful reference. Um, we also have this uh, diagram, which will be useful because we've got a task to identify actors. That's our first task in the workshop. So we've broken it down into these five categories uh, based on the, the diagram uh, found uh, in, a, in a research paper online. Uh, so We've got funding agencies and investors, developers and startups, uh, civil society, universities, and government. And uh, so what we're doing uh, is the open data ecosystem mapping uh, workshop. And I'll let Renzo 
walk you through the, the steps, uh, beginning with this slide that shows the bullseye uh, map that we're using. Yeah, and after quite a lot of talking, now it's time to act and make sure that you, all of you, could just make uh, the best out of this tool. So I just want to again remind you a challenge. I think it's about where is the data stored and utilized, how might we improve open data governance with DAO. So this uh, tool look at ecosystem and this data ecosystem means that you're looking at uh, data infrastructure, people, communities, organization, and how they benefit from the value created by, by the data. So we want to illustrate in this uh, exercise the value exchange as a starting point and you will see how uh, uh, this tool could, uh, this exercise actually, help to identify the, the data stewards, show the opportunities, increase value, and, and helps to explore, collaborate, and inform. So if we go on the next slide, the idea is that we start with um, understanding, okay, mapping the actors at technology. So uh, let's just briefly, so ecosystems are a set of a purposes, products, and services, markets, and they work best when they are connected. And so we need to learn who is in the ecosystem. So what kind of actors and technology. So this is a way to break down the data ecosystem first. And this will imply basically to trigger this systemic view that you will have this uh, view from above and see what are the entities. And these entities might be relevant for your ecosystem. And then we are scanning basically the potential actors. They might become interactions. So next, what we have, I think, is this idea of data flow. So we need to understand how this value is exchanged. So we're talking about before, uh, like code is low, and you know there was this data of the data is the new oil. But let's, you know, we are evolving in, in a way that I think the context of value flow is just uh, how the actors could just create more accessibility to data, as Jane said it before. So this means that we need to understand where the value flows in between. So we need to understand and capture those connections. And next is about, um, I think, this idea of follow the insights. So basically data supports the decision making process with insight and knowledge. So in these steps, we want to just add some uh, less probably tangible layers that could be, uh, I think, soft and formal uh, layers in this exercise. So it could be money that basically uh, you pay a fee for services, uh, some documents in the exchange, or soft value that actually could be support, uh, feedback, policies. And last but not least, I think you will capture opportunities. So what kind of opportunities are in the ecosystem that based on understanding the actors, understanding the interactions, they could become basically future opportunities that probably it will be at the core of your proposal to then look at, okay, how DAO could enable uh, open data. So now we can jump on the, on the middle board. Uh, I think we can share the link or James, uh, is, uh, is already if there's the link in the chat it works hopefully and i'll keep it on my screen uh i'm gonna zoom in and kind of like scroll around okay so so now as we um so i think all, all of you can have access to uh to the mirror and as um just one second i'm sorry having here I am. Okay. So I think here you can see that we have basically what I described before as a four steps. So we start from um, uh, we start from basically uh, capturing the actors. And um, okay, no words happens. So if you want to so, copy and paste some sticky notes, you can start yeah. placing actors on the bullseye, and we'll try exactly. to keep it in this same place. So you don't need to move the background image. So I want to give you um, probably as idea that the way we want to go through this, uh, um, this canvas is having 
just one step at a time. So we're looking first at actors. So we try now to, to look at, let's say, governments, startups, civil society, university, and funding agencies and investors. So like just James did, you can just uh, uh, paste and copy one of these uh, post-its and start typing. And you can add in your uh, uh, views, what are these actors based on these initial clusters that we are giving? So um, what do you think are relevant? And then we just uh, go through like five minutes each of these steps, and then we move forward to the next one. Part of the goal of this would be to capture some of the domain-specific knowledge that you have as participants in NYC Open Data Week. So if you have knowledge about the NYC open data ecosystem that is you know, specific to this uh, city, that's what we're looking for. And um, we can talk through the general flows and the patterns, but I'm excited to learn uh, what people think is important um, when we're thinking about these four steps. Yes. And also, uh, you know, feel free even to type in the chat if you don't feel comfortable uh, to do this on Miro, we can just place for you uh, the camp, the, the post-it. So um, just to facilitate this, that would, that would just help. Let's give a couple more minutes and then we can move forward. Again, this is, a, this is just a starting point. It's a, it's, a, it's a benchmark for your proposal to start understanding, okay, what are the... Um, the interactions that look in the system uh, in the open data New York district could help um, to develop the proposal based on a different type of coordination. So we just mentioned before some input from uh, how the DAO is, but here we are just focusing on your, your own context. So based on your knowledge of the system, just look outwardly and consider, okay, in terms of SMEs or startups or civil society, just looking basically what, what is missing there, uh, they could help to explore interactions. Now, just last minute, because I just want to make sure that we go to the flow of uh, this exercise, and then you can also implement this um, later. Okay, I see some sticky notes multiplying, which is good. Okay, so I think we have quite a few actors. Maybe I give you just the last minute, given that I see that now the, the co-creation starts start happening. Okay, so now based on this uh, first uh, scanning that we did on the ecosystem, now let's consider the type of uh, value exchange that could happen between these actors. Now consider that this interaction could happen between different clusters. Don't think that should happen between government actor or civil society. Could happen from a block party to um, Colombia, for example. And now we are asking, okay, if we look at the exchange of formal value, so could you draw a, a, an arrow that actually is just like this one I put uh, next, that could be just here. Oops. They could just uh, be, um, okay, he's here. So I'm putting here in the, in the middle board, and this could happen that if I draw this arrow, means that between these two actors, there is an exchange of services, money, or documentation, um, physical goods, now, can you think of any of these interactions that are based on this layer, which is more uh, physical rather than soft? So feel free to draw any uh, um, arrow. Also, you can change mine. I, I just uh, create an example. And then, you know, you can have this as a reference to consider the content of your proposal. So uh, anything that you might think of that could create basically a connection, an interaction. And also, if there are any questions, you know, feel free to share it. 
I just want to make sure that uh, this is clear and uh, you can just interact with the exercise. And it doesn't need to be perfect, just to create your own interaction uh, that you think is relevant based on this idea of a physical uh, exchange. So there is anybody is paying money for having in return a service in this ecosystem uh, and then consider this three, uh, through an arrow. Actually, the dotted one is, uh, is a different one. I don't know uh, <laughs> who made that, but we can keep it for the next one. Yeah. So just a couple more minutes. I'm going to move this PTAs thing here. Okay. I like this Department of Education example unfolding. That's a good one. I mean, I'm imagining that the... Go ahead, go ahead, sorry. No, it's okay. The communities, the district, like between funding agency and investors. So this could be a connection here. Yeah, the funding one has the least number of stickies. I'm wondering why. I guess it's yeah, all exactly. funded through government, mostly. I went to a great presentation by the city planning department. They have some great open data resources. So I threw that in here because I know their work is relevant for budgeting and funding. So I put it down here. Okay. Cornell Tech. I, I oh, yeah. read the book about Cornell. Okay. Just one more minute. Just to, if there is any, again, uh, you know, explore something that could create uh, an interaction um, between these clusters. Hi, this is uh, this is Sergio. I have a question. Yeah, please. Um, this is very interesting, by the way. It's a very interesting way to uh, collaborate. Um, are are you considering in in this particular model? Are are all of the possible data sources already contained within the New York City Open Data Portal that's in the middle, or could there be a data source in in the other uh, places of this diagram? The other sources, for sure. I was thinking about that uh, in the center because it is probably going to be related to a lot of things in the diagram. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'll just say, like, one of the guesses I had uh, preparing for this would have been that, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of interplay between like, civil society and the government-maintained open data resources. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of why I was... Um, putting it in the middle because I feel like there can be so many different sources. Um, the agencies you know, identify, structure, upload, maintain, um, but we could also involve civil society uh, potentially through DAOs and um, that could help with some of the challenges. I want to make sure we understand those problems and, and you know, thoroughly explore this map um, before we jump to any kind of solutions. And I would add maybe another layer to your question that I think what James said in the last part of like a DAO. So a DAO is just a way to say there is in the New York City open data portal is the moment at in the middle is a central focus, but doesn't necessarily mean that it would be the only one. I think other actors here can be the center of the data, the open data in a New York City district. And this could be actually uh, the hint to generate, in your view, everybody views, how to generate connection. And through a DAO template that you will develop, you can see how transparency or shared ownership could decentralize in a certain um, area uh, the ownership data or the management of data. So uh, just want to give you another angle of the, of the question. I hope I answered, or oh, we answered to your question. Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, so let's move now, I'm cautious of time. So now we look at this connection between uh, this value exchange formally, but maybe now I'll explore the soft part of this exchange. So there is any actors in this system, they share more in terms of support, policies, feedback, they are less on a monetary level, they're more at a soft level, they're more intangible. So uh, to do so, just give an example, if I wanna do a connection between city planning and Cornell Tech, I will change the type of uh, the dot, it will be dotted. And this means that 
the type of connection here is not based on formal, but it's more based on soft uh, value exchange. Now, I'll give you basically a few minutes to please explore connection in this uh, map mm -hmm. between actors. And if, in your view, please explore which actors. And also feel free to move um, uh, the post-it if it's more comfortable to make a connection, but just uh, create basically the connection between the two based now on a different lens. It's more like a soft, it's less about money or physical goods, documents. It's more about uh, supporting each other, uh, knowledge coordination, uh, policies, um, feedback. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It seems like something is emerging. Think of also not necessarily as something is existing. You can also think something that you imagine this actor are supposed to collaborate in a way that it's maybe soft. You know, just want to maybe push a little bit your imagination that you think uh, maybe you, you are aware of how they collaborate, but probably you want to see something better. So take now this chance to consider how would you imagine if there's going to be a soft collaboration between two actors in this cluster. Because this actually would be the introduction of our last point that um, will trigger basically some, I think, opportunities for your proposal. Would, uh, would your organization be depicted in this diagram, in this model? Or is, would, is that What not... do you mean by your organization? Um, I, I joined the session a little late, but I th yeah. think you described uh, you're part of an organization. Um, so is that, yeah, is that, that correct? Yeah. The goal here is not to reflect our involvement, um, but rather uh, increase our understanding of the NYC open data ecosystem I see. For, the, for the challenge. So actually, the next step, which I think we can start now, is yeah. putting sticky notes around the circle to find opportunities. And you can think of these like your organization that you might propose um, or some kind of solution um, that you might introduce. Uh, so I, I had an idea for, for a potential actor. I tried to illustrate how, um, you know, communities and, uh, you know, their uh, 59 districts across the city have generated some feedback, you know, through the help desk. You know, they contact the NYC Open Data team uh, if there's a need for help around the usage of NYC Open Data. And then the Open Data team, you know, uh, says, oh, well, we need that data. Let's add it to the portal. Um, and, and so over here in civil society, you might see how already civil society is a generic actor, this entity here is contributing data uh, to the open data portal as it's you know, collected and um, you know, basically uh, uploaded uh, by the open data coordinators, which you can see here. Um, and then civil society gets a lot out of that in terms of insights or the soft um, you know, knowledge-based gains. But I was going to throw in an actor here that would be like a data DAO. And so this would be responsible for kind of uniting these two um, processes so that civil society uh, can work with the communities, you know, as an independent, um, organized initiative uh, through, through a DAO, you know, governed by a DAO and with rules enforced by a DAO, um, so that there isn't as much of a, a need to, to coordinate um, with all 59 districts going through a single um, help desk. So, of course, there would be a need for a help desk, but maybe the you know, increased accessibility of participatory governance would enable um, more impactful help that uh, can be provided if you know, less important help is managed through DAOs and, and citizen-led initiatives. Um, but that's my rant. Sorry to take over the workshop for a second. Thanks, James. And uh, I just 
throw in an example here with the sticky notes. You can also decide to use the sticky notes on a connection and between two actors, you can see there is a need of a co-ownership, a transparent co-ownership of data that actually could help to streamline resources. This is what actually also these uh, technological layers of DAO would, uh, would generate benefit and less, um, less blocks to create impact between two actors from a different, um, uh, I think, system within the ecosystem. So that's the, the suggestion. If you want to spend one or two minutes to uh, consider in this, this map, what kind of input would you like to co-create as a new actor in the ecosystem based on the connection? And also feel free um, to share question and input because vocalizing might also help to inspire each other. Uh, if you have any input, uh, feel free to share. If there is no much to, uh, to share, maybe we can offer James the, the examples um, yeah. in the slide. Um, yeah. So just wrapping up, we're going to keep building on this NYC open data ecosystem map throughout our innovation challenge, which is beginning this week. And you can turn those opportunities the hot pink sticky notes um, that we identified at the end, um, and we'll keep discussing. Uh, we're turning those into DAOs and, and kind of thinking through, you know, where are the pain points or bottlenecks or uh, any coordination problems, and how might we address those with DAOs? And for example, if you wanted to DAOify something like wegov.nyc, uh, that could be a proposal that you bring to the data DAO and uh, get funding to experiment with your DAO, um, the week of DAO, if that's your project. Or um, if you have another idea, just think about DAOifying the potential solution and how that might uh, actually help you. And, and um, you can definitely share any feedback on you know, the challenges um, with that approach, hoping to learn from your perspectives and yeah, we're, we're about to kick off our next workshop. I will go back to the Zoom, um, but it boils down to accessibility at the end of the day. That's, that's our favorite word in this open data governance challenge. Uh, so if we're able to use DAOs to increase accessibility of open data through participatory governance, I think uh, we can really imagine a lot of possibilities with uh, experimental data DAOs. Yeah, thanks, hey, Renzo. Man. I'll, I'll uh, Thank you so much for being here, uh, Robin and Richard uh, from the Ocean Protocol ecosystem, here to talk about their real world experience with data DAOs and beyond. So yeah, um, my name is Robin and I'm working with Data Union. So we, we called ourselves Data Union, um, a little bit of a joke. I, maybe back then there was it was not such a big topic. Um, we do this for one and a half years now. So uh, now everybody talks about data unions and we, we call our project like this. And we, we are um, about powering data collaborations for AI. So we're focusing very much on, on making the data um, ready for AI that, that is um, co uh, contributed by several collaborators. So um, we want to do this as a service. So the idea is that basically people can come and, and create data units on their own. So um, and then specifically make the data AI ready and then also co own the insights that are created out of it. So like that connects very well to I think what, what what was done already in, in the in the data map that, that we were seeing before. So we, we do this because um, we see that uh, in the, the AI insight creation, um, there's a, a large chunk of, of time spent in, in collecting data, annotating data, and making the data specifically ready for insight creation. That's like what, what data scientists spend, all, uh, spend a lot of time on actually around 80%. So we think that data units here are something that really can help and accelerate the process so that they can basically take over this part and bring in here also a lot of people and different parties to, to do that and then to also share, share the value created in, in this part and then reuse the data for, for other purposes. So yeah, so we have identified five core components. So one is the data security so an open data it might not be the most important um, topic about but uh, they were using ocean protocol uh, so data can stay in in its location it doesn't have to move so if you have like a 
large data set of, I don't know, like terabytes of data, and you don't want to necessarily send it somewhere else to just work with it. So you can then use uh, ocean protocols, compute the data, send an algorithm there, it inspects and learns from the data, takes its, its learnings with it, and then it can be used somewhere else. And then we um, have a second component, which, which is about co-ownership. So like everybody who contributes to, to the process should also be, a, be kind of a co-owner and get something back from the value that is created. Or in, in case of an open data, it could also be like that they are side, that they are basically mentioned that they have been contributing. So like to, to make sure that there's a provenance system in place, that you really know who was contributing and who was doing something. Um, then the third component is like that we have a play to earn software development kit so that basically if you have to then enhance data that this can be done in a, in a fun way that people can that it's not necessarily work but more and more like a gamified, gamified process and the fourth component is that um, if if you create a data union or a data DAO that you use can use smart contracts so I, I think um, James already will or probably will touch on this a little bit later. But uh, Neo also offered this, offers this, so like smart contracts, which which can help you. And we are building other smart contracts around um, how then value is shared. For example, if data gets sold, that everybody who who's, was contributing gets a share of that, out of this. But all of this with smart contract, so that uh, somebody who is not really knowledgeable about, about um, all of this technology stuff can just use it um, as like Shopify, for example, to make a web shop then they can use our system to make their own data unit. And the last important piece is the market pricing. So like if you want to if you want to sell data or sell some insights, that there is an option to, to determine a price by the market. So that's something that's currently not available in, in, a, in a web 2.0 world. So we are doing this in, in the web three with blockchain. Yeah, um, so we're taking our data units through three different stages. One is the breeding stage where the data unit comes together. So um, People find out, okay, we want to we want to work with our data together. Um, help them to to find a process, how to collect it, and how to make it AI ready. Then we take them in a growth stage where they bring in data scientists and also can bring in investors to make things happen and create the first insights on top of the data. And then in the last stage, they become partners. So then they have a full community and can can uh, continue growing. And we help them with our um, ecosystem. So if you look at an example of how something like this would look like, um, here we have uh, generative art. So on the left side, we start with people that are contributing data to our data union. So that's the one that we we have we are using as our as our prototype. So it's called Planet Computer Vision. It's all about image data, and people are contributing images and enhancing the images, telling what's in the images, and and verifying this information. And then in the next step, we have an algorithm, so a generative art model, for example, with Algovera. So there you can give a prompt and then it generates an image from you. So this, this model is then trained on the data from data from this data union here. So um, over time, as more and more data comes in, also here, this model gets better and better. And then on the right side, we have customers that can ask the model with their prompts to create an image for them. They get an NFT. They can use this in a, in, in a, for themselves or on a marketplace, and, but they make a payment to, to get access to it. And so, like then here, for, for back back from this um, insight, there's a um, value flow back to the data union itself, and from there back to the people. So we can basically now connect uh, the the person to somebody that was just working with the data and contributing it. So like that's uh, that's uh, the, the technology stack um, in an example. And underlying under this, we have um, a tokenomic system. So. Um, we have liquidity pools. We, we have our main data union to token. We have liquidity pools, which which um, regulate access to the data, uh, to also track who accessed which data at which time to to make data provenance possible. On top of this, we have then the insights. So there's again an, another access token to make sure um, that we know who accessed what and and to regulate, um, for example, the price and to be able to also send the value back. Okay. Um, yeah, I, here we we'll shortly jump into into a mirror board of, of my own. Um, so we have modeled this out um, also in, in, in mirror. So I, I like the tool. Um, so here is, is one, on the one side we, we have modeled how can um, how can how can it look like for a data contributor. So like we we see here that there can be, for example, databases from commercial research or governments. Um, on raw data, which can have different formats. 
But then there's also metadata, so a location, um, a, an annotation, what, what it's about. But very importantly is also the identity of the data contributor. So we have a wallet, a decentralized identifier or a SSI identifier. But this is something that we attach to the data contributor. And from there, we, we basically register this in our data unit. So um, this can be um, why also why if you if you would have like a more of a sensor setup, you can have a data source connector. So that's then like, for example, a Raspberry Pi or some other microcontroller, which um, repeatedly can pull some data. And then we check whether this this data that you want, that they want to contribute is uh, existing in a knowledge graph for, for this data union. If it, if it doesn't, we can add it. But then there, there's the DAO coming into play, which is then taking care of, of, uh, of uh, regulating this, this knowledge graph, but also like uh, with, a, with squads of data union creators, they're checking the, 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 the data set. If somebody provided data that, is, that doesn't make sense or just falsely contributes data. So like this is an important mechanism to make sure that the data that's inside the data union data set uh, makes sense uh, and is really usable because we want to use it for AI and insights. So if there's wrong data in it or like just malicious data, then this is very uh, harmful to everybody. Yeah, so um, fast, uh, yeah. And and then we have a next step. So this is then how the data will be used. There we have our data set that is now, now taken care of and created and continuously uh, extended by the contributors. Then we have a data portal to explore it. Um, then the data user can make a selection out of the data portal of this data. So if you have a lot of data, you just probably want to work with a subset of that. And we have a data marketplace where you can look at different insights that, that can work with the data. You can then apply these data insights to the data selection. You could train a new insight if you want to, or you can generate a, a report that you want to have. Uh, you can list this new insight, um, or you could use this insight to extend and also the data set with, with new information. If you look at, at the, the way how this how this works with the flow, so um, we basically attribute to each each data source, to each contributor, uh, a data token. So this can also be a virtual token; it does not have to be a real token. But um, when when a consumption happens here from, from a consumer on, on on the right side, basically this pulls pulls from them back from all of the, the data sources so that were used, that were selected in the data portal. It, it pulls it through um, and can give a pricing indication. And then basically can, can be followed through to the consumer. So we have a, a perfect chain where we know what was used for, for which purpose and can track all of this through uh, in a trusted mechanism through the blockchain. If we look at it from, from the value distribution point, so like the consumer or value in this case could also mean like a citation point of view. So like the consumer consumes something, but then the value can also directly flow back. So we exactly know what, what information was used by, by which data source. We can give something back to 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 um, wallets that are more ecosystem oriented. So, for example, for our foundation or for the data unit itself. But we all can also give something back directly to the people that have been involved in creating the data, in enhancing the data, and so on. So, yeah, th this is a, a, a very important piece um, that that we we are building because um, this basically can enable, in a very very broad manner, uh, the opportunity that people can really. Uh, participate and, and contribute, but later, even in, in the far future, it's, it's, it's then completely clear how, how the, the, the value that is created by their contributions is coming back to them. Okay, um, yeah, so this um, part, we covered this. So yeah, we, we, are, we, are, we are a team already uh, working on this for, for some time. We, we um, have myself as a CEO and CTO, and then Mark is, is, is uh, coordinating our ecosystem, and Chris is our CMO. We have a good a bigger team of developers that are working with us on, on, on this on this technology. We got a lot of grants and uh, currently also finished our seed round. So yeah, um, and the main idea is that data union connects people, data, and insights to power AI. So yeah, that's our, our take on, on data union. Okay, yeah, do, do you have some questions, uh, anyone, about this? If not, I, I would, yeah, Sergio. Hi, hi, Jess, Robin. Uh, pretty, really nice presentation, very detailed. Um, I wonder if there are um, any sample use cases that you can describe. I mean, I, I kind of understand and understood the architecture and, and the models, but are there any um, use cases that you can describe? 
Yeah, so um, the main main use case that we're working on right now is is for for computer vision. So like we have a mobile app where people can take images um, uh, or share their their image um, collections, and then other people can um, annotate those images or so tell what is in the images so that a computer can understand it. And other people look at this and and check whether this is true or not. So like this is this is a very okay. important piece to make sure that you know like that the data is correct. And then again, this is like. Uh, then feeding into all of these mechanisms that I showed right right now. Or another example is um, wh where we won a hackathon recently is about uh, nature data. So it could then be like sensors that, that are all around uh, a city, for example, or or in mm -hmm. nature, or, or then satellite images and so on. And all of them get get also fed into such a system. And then in in the data portal, you can have a view of all of this data and then use it for for insights up around nature, for example, to to determine carbon credits or uh, this kind of thing. I think in, a, in an open data way, this would also be very helpful because uh, the, the the more data you have, the the more you, it makes sense to connect it, to bring it together in in one data union, and then to to have a portal where you can make the connections um, in between them. That that helps you to make like a, a larger collection and then have more deep insight. Okay, yeah. Um, if there are no questions anymore, then I would hand it over to Richard. So hello everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Richard. I'm the co-founder of Algovera. Um, and yeah, it's it's great to be able to join this discussion today. Um, that's centered around the data DAOs data trust paper by Kelsey Navin, um, which is great. Um, and this is it's a use case that we're really excited about. And I guess the message that I want to get across today that um, is that it's great that we have this new data infrastructure and we're pushing for you know data ownership and ensuring that the value um, generated by data is is given back is shared with the users. Um, but you know, onboarding data into this new data infrastructure, whether it's you know data trusts, data cooperatives, uh, data DAOs, data unions, and data marketplaces is just the start. And what we've seen in our experience um, from working in the ocean ecosystem for the past like nine or ten months is that um, there's becoming quite a few um, data sets available, but the data consumed volume isn't that high. And so the reason that we think this is the case is because there aren't a huge amount of data scientists in Web3 for, for some reason, which um, we're trying to figure out. Um, but data scientists are natural consumers of data and they're vital in the process of you know, taking this raw data, processing it, extracting insights, making predictions uh, and increasing you know, the value generated by data um, for the data owners themselves. Um, so yeah, today I'm just gonna talk about some of our learnings and um, just talk about the, the process of um, data science and AI in general, um, and talk about some of the you know theory that we have behind how data science projects get done, uh, and also then use Algovera as a use case to show some of the stuff that we've been working on with um, people like Data Union uh, and also some of our other partners. So um, yeah, just a brief history of AI, I suppose. So AI has been around for a long time. Um, it started around the same time that the uh, computer was being developed. Um, I'm not sure if anyone here has read the book Dream Machine, um, but I'd highly recommend it. Uh, it's really interesting. It's it's about the development of the computer and the internet, um, and also AI features um, quite a lot. So yeah, what what I find really interesting is that the um, development of the internet and all the different versions of the web is like quite closely intertwined with the development of AI, um, and so you know we've we've seen a lot of different phases of AI. We had the AI winter. Um, and you know, just recently, it's become hugely popular again. Um, with um, you know, as the internet was developed, and also as data became uh, bigger. Um, and so, what I'm really interested in exploring is, you know, what is AI going to look like in this next phase, uh, this next generation of the web um, that people are calling Web three. Um, and what's also really interesting as well is that um, another concept that is really uh, some of that features in the Dream Machine book uh, is Norbert Weiner, who's the uh, who came up with cybernetics. And so, um, you know, some of these uh, papers that I've been reading, um, actually by Kelsey Nabb and some other ones, also feature cybernetics. And um, so it seems to be making a comeback. So it's just it's just so interesting that all of these concepts seem to be so intertwined. So these are some of the papers that um, uh, the papers by Kelsey Nabb that I was talking about. So of course she wrote the DAOs as data trust papers, but she's also been doing some more thinking about, um, about other stuff. For example, um, you know, DAOs as um, as structures to govern algorithms, um, and also, you know, asking the question, 
you know, what does autonomy mean uh, in, in DAOs? Um, does it like does it involve governance of algorithms or governance by algorithms? Uh, and this is a big question. So, in other words, what is what are the roles of humans um, in these DAOs? Um, so, a lot of people talk um, about you know governance by by AI algorithms with humans at the margins, um, or does it mean sim symbiosis with uh, an augmentation with machines? Um, so if you haven't read these papers, I'd highly recommend that you do. Um, I think they tie in really nicely with the DAOs as Data Trust paper. Um, and there's also a really interesting case study uh, of Gitcoin DAO. So, you know, with, with all of these different papers, we have the DAOs as Data Trusts. We also have, you know, DAOs as governing the algorithms. And then there's another paper uh, which uses Gitcoin as a case study, which is kind of like um, how the process of developing a machine learning algorithm can take place through a DAO. Um, and I think all of these uh, are really important. But the key takeaway message, again, that I want to reinforce is that uh, DAOs as data trusts is just the start. Um, we also need to process this data and turn it into something useful. Um, okay, so how does the process of AI development happen? Um, so yeah, there's there's this big pipeline basically. So um, as Robin mentioned previously, that like about 80% of the work uh, people say is, you know, uh, preparation of the data. So data acquisition, the cleaning and labeling, uh, feature engineering, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so like the main goal is to increase the value uh, and consumption of the data. So um, people have been you know, um, saying some numbers around what different data unions, uh, the value that they can direct to users. For example, like the Swash app and stuff, I think it's something around like five, $5 a month. And people are saying, you know, is, this, this is a small amount. Um, and what I always say to them is that, you know, um, maybe this is just the raw data. Um, you know, maybe as we develop useful applications uh, on top of this uh, data that's in the data units, maybe that will result in more value uh, given back to the user. Um, and so I think that's what the power of data science can do. Um, so yeah, uh, the other thing about data science is that it requires collaboration between lots of different stakeholders. And so it's quite different to traditional software development in this way, um, because another key uh, uh, person in the process of developing um, a, uh, an AI algorithm or something like that is the domain expert. So um, domain experts could be, um, you know, say a surgeon or a doctor who is used to help maybe label different uh, medical image data sets, as well as interpret the results and stuff like that. And this is one type of stakeholder that we don't have in traditional software development. And then of course we have, you know, the uh, data providers, data labelers, potentially like data trusts. And so, um, yeah, it's quite a complex process with lots of different stakeholders. And you can see in the bottom right um, image, uh, the thickness of the arrows basically um, measures how much the different types of stakeholders uh, talk to each other. And so, yeah, the, a huge amount of coordination is required for this process. And this is probably one of the reasons that the AI stack has be uh, become so centralized. Um, so, yeah, at the moment, um, a lot of AI happens in tech companies. Um, and the reason for that is because the tech companies have, you know, huge amounts of data, which are needed to train state-of-the-art algorithms. They also have the talent and expertise, um, and they also have the capital. And so, you know, we always talk about big tech as, a, as an AI stack, um, and we want to try and decentralize all the different components of the stack. So that's already kind of starting to happen with these data infrastructures, like data trusts and data marketplaces and stuff like that. And that's great because um, instead of the company extracting the value, we can now direct the value back to, to users. Um, but we also want to try and decentralize the other parts of the stack. Um, and the talent and expertise, I think, is a really important one because um, from personal experience, and I've worked for tech companies, um, uh, a few different ones, and what happens is when you join, you sign a contract that basically, like any other company, where you give away um, ownership of all of your ideas and inventions. And what that means is that, um, all of the um, kind of intellectual property uh, becomes centralized in these different tech companies. And that's, um, that's, that's how the tech companies capture a lot of the value of AI. Um, so wouldn't it be great if uh, data scientists could keep ownership of what they create? And um, because in, in Web3, we always talk about giving ownership back to the creators. And usually we mean uh, artists and stuff like that at the moment, but I also think it's important to give ownership back to the technical creators. And then another component, um, 
that is owned by big tech is the infrastructure. So, you know, a huge amount of the storage and computation through Amazon Web Services and stuff like that is owned by big tech. And these are also components that we want to try to decentralize. So why, why is AI uh, centralized? Um, I guess there's lots of reasons. Um, so I think a big one is like network effects and also um, data network effects. Um, a lot of people point to uh, AI being centralized and say it's just the nature of AI, but uh, I think it's just AI as we know it. Um, like I think coming up with decentralized solutions is much more difficult than centralized solutions. So what we tend to see um, is centralized implementations of things first um, before we can decentralize. Um, and you know why? Why is centralization bad? Um, again, from personal experience, like I've worked in tech companies, and um, I think there's like quite a few issues the way AI is done at the moment. Um, like for example, lots of people are working on applications of AI and stuff like that. That um, you know is uh, is questionable. Uh, like for example, when I joined. A company. I wasn't told what team I was going to be put on, and then I got put on the surveillance team. You know, where we were given a data set of a million camera images and asked to track people across different views. And so this was all like very new to me, and I was looking around, thinking, you know, is this okay? And I wrestle with this stuff quite a lot. And so, you know, I think this is what happens when people are um, told top top down what to, to work on. And um, I think humans are generally well-meaning, and um, but can be sometimes, you know. Um, coerced into working on uh, stuff that isn't great for humanity. But, you know, I think if we give uh, data scientists the choice bottom up of, of what to work on, I think they'll generally work on things that are good for humanity, whether that's things like, you know, healthcare applications or um, environmental um, environmental uh, algorithms and things like that. Okay, so um, yeah. So what does the decentralized AI stack look like to, to replace um, the, the tech company? So. For sure, um, the data infrastructure infrastructure plays a big part. So here we have, you know, data trusts, uh, data co-ops, data unions, data marketplaces, um, which uh, we've all been talking about today. But there's also other components, like for example, the infrastructure, so storage and compute, for example, as well as new new ways of doing AI in, in what's called private AI. So these are techniques where um, instead of requiring all of the data in a centralized database, you can, um, you know. That you can send the algorithm to the data set. And so that means that um, it doesn't need to be centralized under the control of, of, a, of a single entity. Um, so there's techniques like compute to data, for example, which Ocean uses compute over data, I think is what Falcoin calls it, where it goes across um, lots of different data sets. There's techniques like federated learning um, and um, lots more private AI techniques like differential privacy and stuff like that that are going to be hugely important. Um, and another aspect is the governance. So um, if we, if instead of you know congregating in centralized companies, we start to work in distributed teams, I think aspects like governance become increasingly important. Um, so, for example, some of the some of the um, tech in this part would, would include DAO frameworks like Aragon and DAOs, also like uh, voting like Snapshot, um, and you know shared treasuries like like Gnosis Safe and stuff like that. So coordination is a is a big uh, aspect. Um, and I don't think it's well known how um, how we should design remote teams, again, just because it's so new. Um, so one thing that uh, I've been looking into quite a lot and I'm really interested in, um, there's, a, there's a community um, called Active Inference Lab. Um, and what they try to do is to come up with these kind of theoretical models um, to look at processes between um, distributed teams. You know, they, they model things like communication, you know, narrative construction, um, you know, collective intelligence uh, and other organizational uh, aspects. And so uh, I think this is a, a really important part of, you know, figuring out how to coordinate um, in, in, in remote teams is this is this theoretical aspect. Um, and then, of course, we, we also have, you know, more practical elements um, that we're trying, as well as things like token simulations, um, which actually uh, I, we like Robin works on and also we work on where we can you know run these agent based models to figure out how agents interact and what's the best way to um, to design uh, these interactions so we have the theory and the the simulations um, and another aspect um, that we have is you know just uh, just uh, doing it in practice and so this uh, this is something that we're we're working on with with Dad Union for example so um, 
What we found is that, um, as I said before, there's lots of different stakeholders required to come up with useful AI applications. Um, one of these is, you know, uh, data unions or something like a data trust um, who, you know, crowdsource data. Um, of course, data unions do much more than this. They try to process the data, uh, but I've simplified a little bit. And so uh, some other teams in the ocean ecosystem are, uh, I call them domain expert DAOs. So for example, Insight is one of these. They're a, they're a DAO of surgeons, um, independent surgeons in the US um, who have these really big data sets of um, images from surgery. Uh, and apparently uh, from, what, um, from what they say, independent surgeons are under a lot of pressure at the moment and they're actually reducing in number. And so they're trying to figure out ways that they can um, you know, become more self-sufficient uh, and monetize some of the data sets that they have. And so we're working with Insight along with Data Union who are helping them to, to label the images uh, and we're building a data science algorithm uh, on top. So that's a collaboration that requires, you know, three different stakeholders, three different DAOs, um, and that's how we're, you know, studying what are best practices to coordinate um, in these new distributed uh, frameworks. And then the other one is, uh, the one underneath Insight is Lynx. So they're a, a DAO of neuroscientists. Um, so they're domain experts in the field of neuroscience. Um, but, you know, they don't, uh, they don't uh, understand, you know, how to create the data science models and stuff, which is what we provide. And then we're also working with Data Union with them um, to provide various aspects of the data infrastructure. Um, so I'm not really sure uh, how, this, uh, how this will look in future. So, you know, Data Union is a DAO that has many different types of stakeholder. And um, they have, you know, their community, I guess, is uh, data labelers. But of course, they also have, you know, data scientists uh, and, and some different stakeholders. But uh, there's, there's signs of, uh, people joining DAOs for uh, one specific uh, background. Uh, and these three types of DAOs aren't the only ones. You know, I've heard people talking about creating design DAOs, so DAOs for designers that act like design consultancies. Uh, and who knows, maybe we'll even have commercial DAOs in future that specialize in, you know, taking data science algorithms and figuring out how to, how to monetize them and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I guess like what we try to explore with all of these collaborations is how we can play positive sum games. So it feels quite different to working in Web2. And I think this is one of the reasons that uh, I enjoy working in it so much is that everything is open, collaborative, um, and it works on the assumption that all ships will rise. You know, um, there's network effects in play. And so if we can, um, if we can, you know, work with each other to increase our network and people working within our network, in theory, that should mean that the value of all of our different networks should increase. So we're not playing zero sum games where, you know, us, we can take uh, business from each other. Um, so yeah, I've talked about Algevar a bit before, but uh, just to give a bit more detail about um, who we are and what we do. So our mission is to decentralize AI. Um, we're trying to ask the question, you know, uh, is it possible to disintermediate the big tech companies? So Web3 and crypto is great at removing the middleman. Um, is the tech company just another middleman? Uh, and do we now have the tools with Web3 uh, to coordinate and, you know, build and monetize without tech companies? Um, we often describe Algevera in three layers. So uh, a lot of the decentralized AI stack that I've talked about that comes under the technology layer. Um, so we're trying to put all of these things together um, into like a platform that makes it really easy for people to, um, to build AI products in Web3 um, with Web3 values. Um, there's also the community layer. So we focus a lot on our community and um, we hold a lot of community events, um, everything from, you know, reading groups, town hall meetings, uh, hacking sessions, we try to provide like educational content and all that sort of stuff. Really just try to recreate, um, you know, what happens, the, like the social sides of what happens in tech companies um, and just, yeah, really build that community. And then also there's the commercialization side. So, um, AI algorithms aren't inherently uh, valuable. You know, you need to find a business use case uh, and solve a real business problem. And so that's where the commercialization layer comes in. Um, and yeah, you know, other aspects like the data marketplace, so giving a, a place where people can really easily and quickly monetize their AI algorithms is a big part of that. Um, yeah, so I've already talked about a few, I think most of these. So 
yeah, we, we hold all of these different events. Um, we also try, uh, we hold, we have these pods like working groups for contributors. So um, for example, we have, you know, a, a, a design pod where we're trying to design the aspects of the, of our future app. We also have, you know, a decentralized storage pod, which is like groups of individuals working on decentralized storage and different companies trying to come together to figure out how can we make it easier for data scientists to use decentralized storage um, and a few different working groups, which are all uh, with contributors from the kind of outer circle of, of Algovera. Um, another aspect that we just ran recently is Algovera grants. Um, and like I said before, the, there's like not a huge amount of data scientists in Web3. And so um, one of the things that we wanted to do was uh, onboard more data scientists to Web3 and, and you know, train them how to use some of the different tools and stuff like that. Um, and what that looks like in practice is setting them up with, um, with DAOs, their own DAOs, so that distributed teams can share a treasury and also you know, govern what's built um, through, through voting and stuff like that. So at the moment we're using, uh, well, we experimented with you know, Aragon, DAO House, and we're also looking at OneHive. Um, and that's something like how we imagine our, uh, our products will look in future. We often describe ourselves as something like a DAO framework made specifically for data scientists. So those DAO frameworks that I mentioned are great, but they're designed for general Web3 users. And so, um, you know, there's there's other actions that data scientists need to take in Web3. And um, an example of these, this would be publishing an asset on a data marketplace. It's currently not possible to do that through a DAO. And um, maybe there's some other aspects like, um, you know, uh, an AI team as a DAO might need access to, to shared storage or shared compute. And so we're just trying to build a DAO framework where when we spin up for a DAO, uh, spin up a DAO for a data science team, they have access to all of the functions that they, they need as a, as a remote data scientist. Um, so I've touched on a few of these. Um, as I said, we're, we're building a DAO framework. We're also building tools like, um, for example, uh, Jupyter Lab. So I'm not sure if anyone here is familiar with Jupyter Lab. It's basically a computing environment um, where you can run different cells of Python code. It's really popular with data scientists. Um, but uh, in in using uh, in using Ocean, the Ocean Data Marketplace with Jupyter, uh, there was a lot of boilerplate code you needed to set up wallets initially. Initially, you have to export your private key from uh, from your MetaMask, which is a little bit unsafe. And so um, we wanted to like make this simpler and abstract away a lot of the, the wallet um, functions by integrating MetaMask with Jupyter Labs. So now you can use this computing environment and log in with your MetaMask and all that sort of stuff. Um, and we're building other Algebra libraries. We're integrating with other Web3 tools like Filecoin and more. Um, and yeah, the main, the main place we've worked is on the data marketplace in the Ocean ecosystem. Yeah, and I've already touched on the commercial side as well. So um, we're, we're trying to provide services for, for data providers. So we have three different offerings at the moment. We have freelance, we have tournament, and we have hackathon. So we have two freelancers uh, working on our project with the with Ensize, who are the medical, the, the DAO of, of surgeons. Uh, we're running a hackathon starting on Friday um, and giving out prizes for, for developing algorithms. And we're also running uh, tournaments or competitions. Um, and yeah, finally, just uh, to say thank you to James and Nir for having us at this event. Um, we're hoping to build like more relationship with Nir. I've known James uh, for uh, for a while since like the start of Quivernauts and stuff. Uh, and I think we have like common interest in data governance uh, and things like that. And so um, yeah, just happy to build this relationship, and we're hoping to you know develop it further, maybe with uh, a grant for Nir and stuff like that in the future. Um, yeah, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, if if the community sounds interesting to you and you're interested in you know working with data trust, developing it, um, and processing the data and extracting insights, uh, consider contributing. Uh, just reach out and uh, chatting. That would be amazing. Thank you. And does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I'm wondering what you think about you know city data um, use cases. Like, uh, where do you see opportunities for DAOs to impact? open data governance in that kind of more public um, you know, governmental uh, context. Yeah, sure. I think like, um, yeah, I think local use cases are really interesting. Um, like I think you were the one that shared the term AI localism with me, James, um, which is great. And I think um, data should be, you know, data that's generated locally should be owned locally. And 
of course has lots of use cases uh, in the local area. In fact, like um, that could be a way to increase the value of data. You know, like if my, the data that I create is probably more valuable to the to the business, the businesses locally uh, around me, right? Um, so I don't know whether that's, for example, um, you know, recommending places that I might like and stuff like that. I think um, I think there's a huge amount of use cases that could be used at the local city level, and even deciding, you know, what are the needs of of neighborhoods and stuff like that. So um, mm -hmm. trying to come up with models to um, to measure. Um, how well communities are functioning and you know what the needs of the communities are and stuff i think um there's a huge amount of interesting use cases cool thank you any other questions going once going twice and i'm sold on algavera and data union and data DAOs. you might be able to tell i appreciate everyone being here and i especially want to thank renzo richard and robin for giving presentations and uh sharing their knowledge with me and, and the community. I want to thank our governance and uh, NEAR, um, where I work, NEAR Foundation, for supporting this event. And I'm excited to kick off the Open Data Governance Challenge uh, with our data DAO on the Astro platform. Uh, so maybe in the last uh, minute or so, I can just highlight where to go for submitting proposals in our uh, evolving open data challenge focused on governance. Um, and, you know, we'll be providing more information. If you want to follow the, the governance account on Twitter, it's at governance DAO. And um, we have our local community here in the city called near York city. So you can follow us on Twitter. Uh, or Telegram is where we have our, our chat. Um, if you want to discuss in real time, and the NEAR forum is a great place to share proposals generally involving NEAR. Um, but uh, if you want to quickly just switch over screens, I'll highlight the, the data DAO where you can go and uh, submit proposals for this challenge. But yeah, thanks. Thanks again, Richard. And thanks, Robin. Thanks, Renzo. Thanks, Zachary and the whole open data team and you know, all the open data coordinators and collaborators out there. Um, really quick, just want to show this data DAO. Uh, so here's the Astro platform, and you can see we've got some funds available for data projects uh, related to NEAR, and we're particularly interested in uh, open data governance um, as a you know a, a crossover between DAOs and, and open data. Um, so if you want to submit a proposal, you just go in here. Um, you'll have to get a NEAR account. And I can help you with that if you follow up. And uh, you can go to the various wallets. Um, Wallet.near.org is one of them. And create your account. But once you have that, you can come into this application running on the Near blockchain and submit a proposal uh, for a transfer. Um, there's also other proposal types here. Um, we're open to all kinds of proposals. This data DAO should uh, evolve in response to the ideas proposed here. And um, one example might be creating a bounty um, where you could you know, see projects that or any kind of um, opportunities that others could uh, undertake. Uh, so you might propose a reward for somebody else, not just a reward for yourself. Um, and going further, you could you know, reconfigure the DAO, uh, add yourself to a group, or create a new group in the DAO. And we have this custom function call ability so that you can propose to do anything on near. Uh, so you could call any other application or uh, the smart contracts um, underlying those applications and perform any uh, function call if a proposal is approved with a vote. Um, so that's just a quick demo. You can go to the astrodao.com platform and search for the data DAO, um, and it'll pop up. Uh, but you'll come here, and uh, you'll see a way to you know, submit a proposal. Just click this green button. And uh, you know we're exploring what does it mean to create a successful proposal in the context of NYC Open Data. So all ideas are welcome, uh, and uh, we hope to you know 
learn from this experience during NYC Open Data Week and uh, you know, build on uh, those lessons learned and uh, really open this up to all 59 community districts across New York City and beyond. So uh, maybe having other uh, open data challenges, open data governance challenges uh, in, in places around the world. Uh, but I'll, I'll uh, stop there. Um, you can see you know, there's not only proposals. Uh, there, there can be other um, ways to use DAO, um, like voting. Um, we mentioned funds and you know, having some NFTs, you know, these non-fungible tokens representing your, your participation, kind of like a badge. Um, but generally, the idea is we're making decisions together in this accountable way um, that is you know, open uh, and really can be used for uh, increasing accessibility of the open data governance processes uh, to increase the participation and, and uh, you know, therefore um, informing the strategic use of data in all the communities around the city. So that's, that's the gist. I'm really grateful for your attention, your energy, and all your hard work as uh, citizens and uh, you know, data people. So thank you very much.